immediately pops in my mind is I will trust in the Lord. And I can't remember the lyrics, but that's one of the songs. And it, and it talks about through trials and tribulations, I'll trust in the Lord through, you know, heartache and whatever I'll trust in the Lord. And you'll get people saying, well, you can only trust in the Lord by God's grace. Okay. Yeah, we get that, but they're expressing how and why they're going to trust in the Lord. And, and as Presbyterian, if you will, yeah, we know that you can only trust in the Lord via his grace and by him calling you, but just enjoy the song, <laughs> you know, quit complaining and enjoy the song. <laughs> well, and that's kind of what I was saying. I don't want to get divisive on imposing my personal views about what should or should not be sung in worship service because we can we can enjoy music in our own worship of God uh, but the the question is what what do we do in corporate worship and you know and there is a strong a strong legacy in the reformed presbyterian church that it is scriptural and even you know sacred and and we'll get to that in a minute about what i mean by that but uh, you know so there are some songs where we might sing about how we feel about this or that and they may be nice christian songs but they might not be sacred right right no and i'm with you on that one i'm not just you know saying get up there and sing something that's completely out of the box right but I, because i listen to a lot of music i am pretty well in depth on what music is or what song is off like completely with doctrine and which ones are very close to doctrine yes you know so it's all a matter of how you interpret that song and and you know i can listen to that particular song that i mentioned and understand why that song was even written you know even though it's not a hundred percent close to doctrine if you will yes you kind of went deep with this one but you went to the epc's book of worship <laughs> um, absolutely <laughs> and you, you pulled out i don't know if that's the lawyer in you or what but you pulled out chapter two section seven where it says uh music is in worship and briefly i want you to tell us why you went to the book of worship well again because um i needed to secure the argument that music and worship ought to be sacred and so i have to look at the doctrine to support my argument you know when as a lawyer you have evidence you have laws you have things to support your argument. And so that's kind of how I pulled that thread through through this essay is when you're making the case for sacred music, you have to support it. And so this is part of my support is the doctrine, the book of worship, that music in the public worship of God is the chapter. And it reiterates our reformed doctrine that all the congregations should sing sacred music in corporate worship. And in fact, I would encourage everyone to read that. You can get it online in the on the EPC page with um, with that chapter two, part seven. Starts with this: the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with grace in the heart is a necessary and indispensable part of the corporate worship of the people of God. So. Our book of worship says it's necessary and indispensable to sing those things, songs, hymns, spiritual songs. The whole congregation is the true choir, singing praises and giving glory to God. Corporate singing is not to be neglected. And that is so critical because what I have seen happening in some of the contemporary worship is they have performers. Yeah. And you don't have congregational singing. And we need to guard against that because that is not what the Bible wants us to do. I, I agree. The, the Bible doesn't want us to be entertained. God does not want us to be entertained during worship. God wants us to worship him. And so that is why, you know, I go back and make this doctrinal argument that we, we must have sacred singing and the congreg congregation is the one to do it. Hmm. All right. I'm a choir member. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> but we're not supposed to be entertainers. We're supposed to lead the worship. <laughs> right. Like angels. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> well, we're going to take a quick break. Hey, guys. Thank you for listening to this episode. 
We'll be right back after the break. Hi, this is Christy Lundy with Bucket List Travels, specializing in faith-based trips. I work with a tour company that has over 40 years' experience and over 40 itineraries to choose from. These trips are all-inclusive and offer payment plans, making it a reality for most of your congregation to participate in. Your church family will bond with each other in a deep and meaningful way by experiencing these locations together. Bring the Bible to life by visiting these locations in which the accounts took place. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus, Old Testament prophets, and New Testament disciples. After deciding the itinerary your church would love and benefit from the most, I will take over all planning, travel arrangements, information meetings, collecting documents, information, and payments, leaving you the time to be able to prepare for the trip as a spiritual leader of the group. You can create small Bible studies, devotionals, and focused prayer times. If this sounds like a valuable investment for your church, contact me by email at bucketlisttravelagent at gmail.com or message me on Facebook at bucketlisttravel by Christy Lundy to set up your phone call or meeting today. Have a blessed day. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? You see, when I was trying to get my podcast off the ground, I had a lot of questions. I mean, like a lot, like a lot of questions. Questions like, how do I record an episode? Or how do I get my show into all the apps that people use to listen to podcasts? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every one of these questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it is completely 100% free and super, super, super easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that is exactly what I'm doing right now by reading this ad. So if you always wanted to start a podcast and make money doing it, go to Anchor. Go to anchor.fm slash start and join me in a diverse community of podcasters already using Anchor. That's anchor.fm slash start. I cannot wait to hear your podcast. Hey guys, I'm glad you stuck around. Now let's get back to the conversation. All right, so welcome back. Now we're going to go ahead and ask the question that you've been itching to get to. (laughs) What do you mean when you speak of sacred music? Yes, sacred music. You have to go to the Latin for this one. All right, let's hear it because I am not in depth in Latin. <laughs> so let uh, the word sacred, and and I have to give, I have to give credit to my pastor on this because he he was one of my reviewers before I submitted this chapter, and he prompted me to look into that a bit further about what is sacred music, and it is from the Latin sac sacre which means to consecrate. So the adjective sacred and the noun sacrament come from the same Latin word. Hmm. Set apart. Yes, just to to consecrate, we dedicate or set it apart to worship a deity. And so, for example, one sacrament we use in our church is the Holy Communion. Right. It has certain elements. It has bread, wine. The, the blood and body of Christ. We can hear about those elements. We can read about the Last Supper, but until we consume, consecrate these elements and consume them, we have not celebrated the sacrament. So likewise with music, we can compose and sing music because of God. And it may be beautiful music. It may move us in, emotionally. We might even cry, but these do not make it sacred and holy. Music is sacred when God is the object and the subject of our worship. In other words, we worship God and God is what we worship. Hmm. All right. So why sacred music? Why is music sacred or why do we have sacred music? Why, why do we have sacred music? Well, uh, sacred music is that which gives reverence, thanksgiving and praise to God. And our church doctrine, which supports the fact that we should have it, doesn't tell us exactly what that specific song would be that is sacred. Although we know it must reflect God as the subject and the object, because that is the definition of sacred. So immediately following the Reformation, only 150 songs were sung in worship. Those 150 songs were the Psalms. 
And so in selecting music that is sacred, our best guide is the example that we get from scripture. So we, we alluded to this already. So when is music considered sacred? And, and I want you to repeat what you said, because that was very important. And I want the listeners to, to grasp that. What, what do you mean? Or when is music considered sacred? You mean about God being the object and the subject? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So music is sacred when through the music we worship God and when God is the reason why we worship. Hmm. So if a song talks about certain happy things and stuff, it might be fun and entertaining and we might enjoy singing it, but God's supposed to be the focus for music. You then went to the book of worship, chapter one, uh, point four, and I'm trying to turn there. And I want to look at some scripture that's with that. The, the book of worship? Yes. And that would be the church as a body of Christ. And basically this chapter is uh, man's chief end. Oh, okay. Yeah. Book of worship one, four. I know what you're talking yep, about. That'll be page 136. If you have the 2018, 19 version of the book of order. I've got it right here. Uh, the book of worship, the body of Christ. This is where we, as the saints gather together as the body of Christ. And, um, that, that's our corporate worship. We are Christ in the world. We are the instruments for the Great Commission. We present the gospel through our worship. Now, I want to take a look at Psalm, Psalm 73, 24, 28 says this. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far, those who are far from you shall perish. You put to end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. Verse 28. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell all of your words. Now, that that's talking about, you know, God being or man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So when you're looking at worship, if we're glorifying God through preaching, we should glorify God through teaching. We should glorify God through the sacraments. We should glorify God through music. And this is how I'm able to understand when a person says, man, they just took that song and butchered it. And I'm talking about like an old hymn, like a, a solid good hymn of the church. Uh, for example, getting Beyonce to sing Amazing Grace um, and her adding her flares to it. You know, that would be, in my eyes, butchering the song because the song in and of itself is sacred. And that song in and of itself literally shows God's grace. I mean, we're talking about a formal slave owner who wrote this song. Yeah, whenever we look at the book of worship and we talk about man's chief end and worshiping God as one, we, I'm not going to say we, some people tend to forget and they, you know, they, Oh, well music is supposed to be, we need to draw the crowds. We have to have more people mm -hmm. coming to church through our music. So we have to have a full band, you know, we have yeah. to entertain instead of singing from the heart. Yes. That, that Those are some of the arguments. And I'm, I wonder when I hear them, if they're driven by the gospel or if they're driven by the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could see that in, in some churches and, and I don't like being judgmental, but when it comes to performance and stuff like that, I'm, I'm like, well, what is this about? You are God, you know, that, well, that's, I, you know, why, why are they concerned about drawing the crowd when God is the one who speaks to the heart is kind of what I'm saying the world says, let's bring in the crowds and get big business going. And God says, what? Preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and God speaks to the heart and draws people to him. Yeah. We are instrument. Our job.